All right. Hello all, welcome. We will get started pretty soon. We're gonna give everybody until about 6.02 to get logged in, and then we will go ahead and get started. Yes. Let's see what we got. Okay. Give everybody about a minute again. All right, it's officially 6.02 on, on, on my watch. So hello and welcome to this evening's Zoom webinar that's being produced by the Honors College at West Virginia University. This event is the third of our five faculty fellow lectures taking place this fall semester. These lectures are designed to allow each honors college fellow an opportunity to provide an inside look into the innovative course they are currently teaching within the honors college and will be teaching next spring semester. I am Damon Clement, Associate Dean of the WVU's Honors College. Tonight's lecture is entitled Use and Abuse of Science with Dr. Wagner Benedito. Dr. Benedito is a professor of biochemical genetics at WVU. We will follow our standard Zoom webinar format this evening. After the presentation, we will host an open question and answer session. Since we are using the Zoom webinar platform for this lecture, before we begin, let me review some of the features that will help you experience this, this evening's lecture in the best way possible. If you have issues with audio or volume at any computer volume controls. If you have questions, please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Due to enhanced security protocols, webinar attendees will not be able to see others' questions, only their own. To ask a question, you may click on the Q&A button, a separate screen will appear, then you may type your question. The presenter will answer all your questions live at the end of the presentation. If live captioning has been requested, it can be viewed by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. If live captioning was not requested, a captioned version of this recording will be available at honors.wvu.edu. And now let's start this evening's lecture. Dr. Benedito, it's over to you. I'm gonna stop the share. And now you should be able to share. Yes. How is that? Does it work well? Yep, I can see it. Yep, I can see it. So you're probably for... not in. Okay, yep, there you go. You're good to go now. I'm go okay, good. Well, first of all, I'd like to um, thank the opportunity of being here to being part of this effect fa honors faculty fellows program. Uh, it's a really great honor and um, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to offer this class, Use and Abuse of Science to the Honors College. Uh, we start this class this semester. Uh, it's going fantastic. I, it's really lots of fun uh, teaching honors uh, students. And I would like to, to talk about what we are covering in this class and what we are doing so that you might consider taking it in the spring semester. So, um, 
this course actually uh, uh, explores what science is, what is scientific and what's not scientific what science can deliver and what it cannot deliver is also an important part of it, right? So that we are, um, uh, we understand how science can produce new knowledge, uh, who science serves and uh, uh, how people can use, abuse and misuse science. So we utilize this uh, uh, Science and Society by Peter Dumfo uh, as, a, as a guide uh, text throughout the, the semester. And we also supplement with additional literature. Um, that's a very light uh, reading in the literature also, uh, just to give us a taste of what scientists does and how science is made. So first of all, I'd like to start by um, asking you all to observe this checkboard. And I ask you, which square is dark, A or B? And I'll give you a little bit of time to um, verify and have your answer. Which one is darker, A or B? So this is what our senses uh, do, right? Most probably you are expecting A to be, to be darker. But when we actually put a, two lines of same color, we verify that A and B are the same. It's just a mind trick by this shadow. So our senses can lie to us. So we, need, we uh, in science, we utilize method to analyze the world and to find truth. It's mind boggling. Even with the line, sometimes we cannot even perceive that they are the same. Still, the, our, our um, brain translates things that are not there. In the same way, um, many of you might remember the infamous dress that uh, took over the internet. And I can ask you, which color is that? Is it um, gold and white or is it black and blue? So, um, it was, uh, it, it, it was a fantastic problem. And uh, it took us actually many years to, or two years to, uh, for science to find and to identify a proper explanation. The, the dress is actually blue and black. I, I see uh, uh, white and gold all the time, but uh, a color theory explains how our brain would translate light and how it translates color to us. So it's a fantastic way of, of telling us how um, our senses can lie to us and we need method to find truth. Another way to see how science works is through this projection. So we have an object that's a 3D and it's truth, right? It's reality, that's a real object and then we can shed, uh, uh, shed light in certain perspectives and find these into uh, 2D projections in different angles, giving us different answers. And both of them are true, right? So different perspectives giving different answers and all of them being truth. So that's um, basically how science works. We try to identify truth, but always keeping them um, open mind that the, the uh, knowledge that we have now can change later. So that is uncertainty in scientific knowledge as well. So science can help us navigate the world, find truth about the nat natural phenomena. We do not deal with, um, with things that are supernatural. We only deal with what is natural. So science, it's not the realm of science work with supernatural. Um, science helps us uh, expand our knowledge as a humanity and also advance technology. But science cannot deliver certainty because all scientific knowledge we call accepted truth is amenable to change as we evolve and as we understand more about systems and about the world. And uh, this is well captured by 
a quote uh, 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 by Einstein that says, no amount of uh, experimentation can ever prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. So it's uh, a, a very telling, and we are going to explore how this is actually very telling of the science making. So um, as scientists, we navigate the world about, about fake and fact, and we try to distinguish them. And we try to um, uh, counteract anti-science theories like flat earth. We also try to um, make the public understand that uh, there is uncertainty in scientific finds. So when when uh, um, the, the, the public wants to know if GMO are, um, GMO foods are uh, dangerous or not, and we can, we, we come and find, well, there is evidence that they are safe. And then the public wants us back. Are they absolutely safe, 100% or, or you are unsure? And the scientists will never guarantee you they will never find 100%. They will say that as most likely data suggests, but there is no, um, we do not deliver certainties because it's always amenable to change, right? But we can deliver accepted truth and we can uh, deliver a cert a cert a a an amount of certainty to that, to that finding. So the same thing happened during the pandemic, right? So the pandemic hit, everything changed in our world, right? So there was a new virus. Um, there was this uh, request for masking, a request to stay home, quarantining, the new development of a vaccine. CDC became uh, a center uh, in the news. And we saw how science was developing, right? So how we were understanding the virus, how vaccines were being developed uh, and tested, the testing of a vaccine became very evident in the news. Um, and, and it showed us uh, the science making. And many times the public was uh, actually not uh, well-versed in science and wanting us to give guarantees Giving, giving them things that um, science is not, uh, um, does not do. But, uh, but the science, science proved to be very useful in developing this vaccine that was very much um, effective uh, against um, uh, the, the infections or at least very uh, having, uh, have uh, um, um, symptoms, severe symptoms. So it was a very interesting, way of understanding what science can do to humanity and how it was um, uh, made peer-reviewed uh, or, or new studies. And then people would say, well, be careful because it, was not, it, it has not been peer-reviewed yet. So we could understand a little bit about that. Um, when the pandemic start, I wanted to understand more about what a pandemic is, what were the findings of, of uh, uh, the pandemic there, the flu, uh, the, uh, the flu pandemic in the beginning of last century, um, how this virus, the coronavirus was. So I started reading books and, and papers, and those are the three, three of the books that I read. Uh, Apollo Zero came a little bit, um, uh, uh, one year and a half after the pandemic started, so I was able to read and get some insights about the, the uh, coronavirus pandemic. But uh, Sonia Shah had written before about pandemic, uh, before this pandemic even, uh, portraying other pandemics in history. And Marilyn Rossink, the, this uh, illustrated guide, virus, um, beautiful pictures uh, with electron microscopies about um, those viruses. Marilyn Rossink, Rossink was actually a colleague of mine, my postdoc. So we were able, I was able to build up knowledge, understand a little bit better to help me navigate through the pandemic. It was really in interesting and uh, insightful. The other thing that uh, science is very good at is making prediction. And uh, we can see here, for example, uh, the CO2 levels uh, rising um, to very, um, to, um, very high levels 
uh, uh, today, we are above 400 ppm of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and this, we know that it's not uh, cyclic, right? So you see that it, it extrapolates the normal cycle of CO2 in the atmosphere. We also see in the graph below the sea level rising, and it's uh, an upright. Um, and this kind of uh, things happening um, today was predicted already 1912 in this small note here, coal consumption affecting climate and uh, um, statistical models predicting that um, uh, the rise of CO2 by uh, industrialization, industrialization could actually lead to global warming, um, very much so. Today I went to uh, satellite imaging and I, I focused the, um, uh, this picture on the Amazon forest. And we can see here um, a lot, some clouds, but a lot of um, smoke. Um, and you see also points where there is um, fire, large regions uh, burning up in, in the Amazon forest. So you see here the, these, uh, these um, red dots or orange dots, they are regions of fire and you see the smoke come from there. You also see a lot of smog going south from, um, from the region to the southern Brazil, all these being um, um, caused by burning um, to clear the region for, uh, for grazing of, of pasture for, for um, cows. So very problematic. We know that if we burn 20% of the Amazon forest, we, are, we arrive to a point of no return. So from there on, what happens is that the Amazon forest will become desert. So those are modeling that was produced by NASA and, and shows very clearly that um, we are approaching a point of no return in the Amazon forest. So this is science alerting us to uh, uh, what can happen. We also see climate change affecting fires in California, in Portugal, um, in uh, Spain. So, um, and, and all this is uh, explained and even predicted by science. So science can uh, um, not only predict, but bring viable solutions to humanity problems, uh, one of them climate change. So we have basically to listen, but because of the uncertainties, right? That science brings to us as scientists, we are always um, uh, uh, reluctant to affirm 100% because that's not what science delivers. Uh, while uh, politicians, right? They are very well known for promising, asserting, and then not delivering. So that's not how science is made. Um, so we can find solutions through science to our problems as well. So once we understand this in my class, we start exploring the science making and uh, we start with the philosophy of science, right? So how um, reality through truth, knowledge, right? Uh, is uh, uh, intricated in the science making and how the scientist is also a philosopher, right? And how we use logic and language to persuade, uh, persuade uh, our public about our findings without 100% uh, 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 of certainty. Uh, we go on with the scientific method. So this week we are exploring our class, uh, the scientific method, and we, we start understanding all the process and the method that that is to find new knowledge, right? So creation of a hypothesis and experiment. So how the experiment has to be set up and conducted, how data is gathered, um, which kind of analysis are there to, to be made and how we do it to, to find truth in an unbiased way, how we take conclusions, and then we start again making new questions and, uh, and proposing new hypotheses. So all this is explored in this course. Um, then we move on to how we analyze data, right? And so how math gives science power. Um, and we are uh, enabled 
to understand certain memes that uh, can be very funny for the scientist. Um, that, uh, for example, this one here playing with the p-value, and you must have a p-value of at least 0 0.05 because I fail to reject you, right? Um, or, or this dog crying because the p-value is higher than 0 0.05. We also have a critical eye uh, on, on this analysis of p-value and how, for example, very small changes can lead us to a p-value of 0 0.051, and then, oh no, and, or just a small thing going to a p-value lower than 0 0.05, and yes, we got it. So we are critical of this type of, um, of, of understanding of math um, applied to science as well. So we can explore that. Um, uh, regarding statistical significance, right? So please, can you lower your p-value just a little more and see a statistical significance as no means no, right? So, and also because we are uh, in the fall season, so a p-value of 0 0.06 can be very spooky for the scientists. So we can explore this and understand. Um, uh, next week, for example, I'll be discussing with my uh, graduate class uh, the p-value and, and uh, the rules on how to use it very carefully. So there are, uh, uh, the scientist is very skeptical, right? So, and also a self-critical um, and a critical thinker. So all this is, um, uh, has to be used during data analysis. So um, coming back to that, um, a projection, right? It is the truth of the object and projecting into two Ds and the two Ds that are different. I use this a lot in my research as well. So we use, for example, principal component analysis that is actually um, uh, when we have too much of a large data that we cannot understand just by browsing or, or, or doing simple statistics, we want to reduce the amount of data and only get the juice of it. Um, and, and this is what PCA does. So we have here um, a 3D uh, uh, spatial data distribution. And what we want uh, the PCA analysis do is to reduce it in, the, in two dimensions. So we can actually understand the, 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 the data much better. And we do this all the time for large data sets in research, including, including my own research. Um, and so, as I said, the scientist is a, 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 a critical thinker and is skeptical. So if you see this uh, um, report of, um, from um, the end of August, bringing uh, that PCA um, in population genetic studies are highly unbiased and calling uh, the uh, the investigations to be uh, thousands of investigation uh, studies to be reevaluated. So that's how science goes. So of course there, is, there are a lot of people counterbalance this understanding as well. So there is a a, a, a very big um, um, debate in the scientific community now, triggered by this paper, the validity of this type of analysis. So science evolves. Science, so what was true uh, yesterday might not be today. Um, so there is this type of uncertainty and this debate. So that's how science evolves. Passing um, that we, we also tackle the history of science and uh, how the scientific thinking and how uh, our understanding of the world evolved since the ancient Greeks, maybe even before, certainly much before, uh, through today, passing through several phases. And we, I'm sure that you can recognize many of those phases here. One thing that's interesting though, is that all of those big scientists are European or of European descent and they are men, right? So most of them um, that we know through history, um, with a few exceptions, are um, male European or white male uh, uh, scientists. 
So, but actually, we have to uh, to see that this ethnocentric gender bias is very obtuse, and we um, should expand our knowledge and um, and recognize the contribution of diversity to the scientific thought um, and to understanding of the world. So we have here um, opportunity in my course to explore uh, Native American, uh, African American contribution to understand to sci science and technology. Um, and I, um, you may recognize some of these names. And as an agronomist, I want to point out George Washington Carver on the um, top left, and he is uh, uh, he is uh, some known by some uh, as a peanut and um, and a sweet potato uh, researcher. But actually, he contributed to so many inventions. It is a very rich. Um, history at Cornell University, um, beautiful history to know, and so many other ones. And also, we have to recognize the role of women in, in, in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we have here, for example, on the top left, um, um, uh, Mileva uh, Marik, who, is, who was actually the first wife of Albert Einstein, and actually helped him to develop the theory of relativity. She didn't get the Nobel Prize. She uh, didn't get uh, so much fame. And now there is, there is uh, uh, a tentative to bring her uh, center to, the, to this development in history. We have uh, uh, Jane Goodall, who actually transformed our way that we think ourselves as, as humans and um, our ways that we interact with uh, other primates and uh, with nature. So a very, very uh, uh, beautiful contribution. We also have uh, Jamaki Amal, Indian a botanist who actually studied and contributed to the, uh, to the area of bo uh, botany. We have Marie Curie, uh, who is, um, is the only woman who got um, a, Nobel Prize, a, a Nobel Prize twice. Um, together, one of them together with uh, her husband, uh, um, Pierre Curie, and also uh, the, the family whose uh, Nobel Prize were given, or, or were given most times. Her, her daughter also was uh, a Nobel Prize winner. So uh, an amazing woman who contributed to and dedicated to science. I tried to get a picture of her smiling, but I think she was quite a serious woman, so I couldn't. So we also have, uh, um, Barbara McClintock, who um, uh, made uh, unbelievable discoveries about our genomes and our DNA, how it worked. And she worked in corn, but and then it was translated to everything, including to human genome as well. And we have uh, Rosalind Franklin, who actually, whose data was stole by Franks and Crick to build the model of DNA double helix structure. Um, and she died before the Nobel, uh, the, the Nobel Prize was uh, uh, presented. Uh, um, and and um, uh, so she, she was not a Nobel Prize winner. Um, and at, at the last on the left, we have Jennifer Dudna, who invented, co-invented the um, uh, gene editing, um, this revolutionary uh, uh, technology that we are using in my lab all the time. And it's really, really, uh, um, um, a wonderful finding to, to understand the genome and also for a cure of diseases that are um, coming out. So an amazing thing. But I also want to recognize um, uh, Mary Gold Ross, the first Native American um, aerospace engineer, um, uh, also making fantastic discoveries here. And because I'm corny, and a corny plant biologist, I put a marigold there so that you don't forget her name, Marigold Ross. Um, and not to, to forget Katherine Johnson, uh, a West Virginian, first African-American woman to attend grad school at WVU, and whose uh, uh, name is actually on a conference room in the College of Engineering that I invite you to visit. So contribution of women as well, we cannot forget that they have been seminal and are seminal to advancing uh, science and our understanding. With all that, we will explore how science 
uh, uh, in society, uh, um, converse, and how it drives innovation. So how science contributes to, uh, through research, to innovation, to technology, to new findings. Um, we explore scientific rewards. So what is there for the scientist, right? Um, and here is the Nobel Prize, the ultimate prize of science, the ultimate recognition of doing good science, an amazing thing. But uh, we can also go more. A scientist can work for stickers. Um, a scientist is rewarded when we see things that we have worked for, working the world, contributing. Uh, nothing more rewarding than being a space engineer working at NASA and, and seeing the launching of a, a rocket. We also have reward by seeing our, our work published in peer-reviewed journals, right, like science. Um, and also uh, in our own society, right? So um, scientists make their own societies. And in this one, I put a logo of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. But um, there are many others. I belong to the American Society of Plant Biologists, ASPB. And with that, we actually know each other. We uh, communicate. When I write something, people peer review, and we have this um, collaboration and this communication that works for uh, uh, each one checking the work of the, uh, each other in advancing science through through uh, uh, finding truth and advancing science. So with all that, we, we have to explore sci uh, science integrity, um, being in check of each other's work and also explore how things are scientific or not scientific, they can be pseudoscience. So lots of ethical issues that we can explore and why we have to keep ethical to report what's truth. So we are, we are committed to truth, we are committed to data, and we are committed to report what we see. So um, all these issues of experimentation in humans, conflict of interest, plagiarism, all this is uh, uh, seen in this chapter of uh, scientific integrity. So, and with this one, I would like to recognize the work by Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Bink on um, imaging forensics. So what she does is she goes through journals um, and she tries to recognize, she's very good at recognize duplications in images. And, and this means that the author tried to glue together and falsify information. And this is one here, one example that was caught red-handed. Once she finds that, she uh, uh, contacts the, um, the editor of the scientific journal uh, that that paper was published, and she asks for retraction. Because this type of um, fake science can hinder the advancement of, of science, because we, are, we, are, we build from each other's work. And uh, um, um, and if this is a wrong result, it's problematic because people will build over uh, um, their experimentation over um, false data. So very problematic for the advancement of science. So um, a big, big um, ethical issue. So then we go on to explore pseudoscience and how it relates to science, right? So science is very systematic, it's methodical. It, it requires um, uh, assumptions that are very strict, right? Randomization, controls, blind studies, um, very much uh, uh, a set of tools that are, are uh, difficult but necessary. And pseudoscience is more, I just know, I read on Google, uh, it's my intuition, somebody told me, I really want it to be true. So we have to be very careful with pseudoscience. So a scientist has to recognize pseudoscience and has to call, uh, to call it. So uh, because pseudoscience can lead to conspiracy theories and anti-science movements, right? 
Um, we can see even, for example, this uh, anti-vaccination uh, society of America already in 1902, um, uh, just before the, 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 the flu a pandemic, very problematic. Um, uh, and that, that leads to today. And we saw how uh, vaccination has, has hesitancy uh, actually was problematic during the pandemic, the, the coronavirus pandemic. So very, very complicated. We also have movements like the Flat Earth Society. You see that it's a powerful society. They even have a society, right? Uh, uh, it's a movement that's quite well organized. Um, so it's more than a joke, right? Um, and we also have UFOs, Loch Ness, um, Monster. And even this book that I, I highly recommend, a lot of people are saying, right? How conspiracy can be an assault on democracy. So it's not an ex exaggeration. So I, um, we discuss this, um, uh, these cases. Um, and as I said, the, the scientist is a critical thinker, right? So we have to exert that, that faculty of think deeply, think critically, and, uh, and being skeptical by nature, right? So we always second guess, or we, we are always double checking and checking each other as well. So uh, it's a wonderful uh, tool to be a critical thinker. So we actually discuss, uh, we'll discuss that and uh, um, uh, develop tools to develop our, or sharpen our critical thinking skills. So we move on to roadblocks to science. What is actually hampering the advancement of science and, adv and, and, and advancement of technology, right? And one of them is funding, right? So we see here how uh, research uh, go, uh, federal uh, funding is distributed in this uh, pie chart. And we see that half of it goes to the Department of Defense. And uh, another chunk goes to NIH, but not as much, right? So this is human health. Um, the next one, Department of Energy, NASA, and then we have NSF. All this, all the basic basic research in the U.S. is fund, funded by this small dark orange uh, piece. So, uh, and this goes with so much uh, uh, what uh, we, we do as a, as a, as a country in, uh, in basic sciences. So another one is also a legislation, right? So can be helpful. Um, but can also be a roadblock. One example is this enactment of 1996 uh, Dick, uh, called Dickey Amendment that uh, because of gun um, lobby, gun industry lobby, um, prevented the CDC from using funding to advocate or promote gun control. So even um, generating um, uh, uh, statistics or data on gun violence was forbidden. So it largely shut down research into gun violence in the United States. It was only um, uh, invalidated recently with Obama uh, in power. So all this time, we were unable to collect data or do uh, funding uh, or, 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 or do research from with federal funding because of this enactment. Um, and then we go also uh, um, many roadblocks to science education, right? So especially from the point of view of uh, personal possibilities of carrying on and um, um, developing scientific mindset, developing an education to science that could contribute. And this is a major problem because bright minds, um, geniuses could be developed with proper, proper support. And uh, we see that many times this doesn't happen, right? So this is from a basic uh, or elementary uh, school, middle school, high school, and college and, and uh, um, grad school as well. So very big, big problem that uh, needs to be solved to actually open up possibilities and um, um, 
uh, allow talents to come to science and develop our understanding of the world. So there is also optimism on all this, right? So science is as a solution to humanity problems, right? We will actually uh, uh, explore the rapid um, advances in the 20th century because there was funding for science. Uh, an example, the, the space race, right? A super expensive, but necessary, right? Um, and, and so many other things. There's the development of the internet. We are here. Uh, uh, possible uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, to talk to each other uh, remotely because of the internet, right? But before that, the development of the computer, right? The personal computer and goals. And we also make conjectures of the next big innovative revolution, right? Uh, very interesting here. Uh, we, we discuss science education, the need for good people in science, as I um, mentioned briefly, the high school and the college divide, right? So many of your high school uh, teachers, they learn through, um, through textbooks and they pass on the information, but they didn't have much a college, a, a lab experience, right? And in college, I am there in the, in the classroom, but I also have a lab, I run my lab, I have my, my hypothesis, I do my science. Um, so uh, I, I'm teaching from experience. So the need for change, right? To improve how science is taught in the school, to develop the scientific mindset already in kindergarten and they're just building up how we can democratize science, make science available to every citizen to understand science, to be able to even do some science with us in collaboration, what we call citizen science. But science is also at the risk. We have to understand how, uh, the, how the US is falling in its dominance in STEM areas. Um, um, more, uh, in the past, some decades ago, you open um, scientific, good scientific journals. Most of them were uh, papers from the US. And now um, we don't have that supremacy anymore. So we can, uh, we can discuss these risks as well. And how the improvement of science ed education is our link to succeed, a, a success, right? So with that, I would like to thank everybody who attended this class and again, Damien, for the opportunity, the Honors College, it has been a great, great pleasure to, um, to be here with you. So I will tell you that my class, uh, we, um, we actually spread the activities out. We don't have exams, big exams, but we have lots of activity that we ensure that you will learn the concepts, we will have uh, an opportunity to think, and we we'll have an opportunity to uh, to uh, um, uh, to, uh, to have this conversation with each other, so that our um, uh, object learning objectives are are completely accomplished, but without having to have a one or two uh, major um, lessons uh, or exams. We spread this throughout the semester, so it has been an active learning. Um, um, flipped classroom, so you, you read the textbook before coming to class so that we can have a fruitful conversation about the topic and uh, what you understood, what you misunderstood, but mostly how we can actually um, um, further your understanding of science, how it can be used and abused. Um, Damien, with that, I thank you for the opportunity again, and I'm open for questions. All right, Wagner, thank you so very much for your excellent presentation. I, 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 I was really, I learned some things and I took some things away. So that was very, very, very insightful. Um, I see a couple of questions on here. So the first question here, hi, thank you for your presentation. I noticed it was emphasized that most scientists are white males. Is there something wrong with being white or male that makes this a shocking statement? Oh, okay. Paul, thank you for your question. Yeah, no, there is nothing wrong to be male, 
to be white, to be of European descent. The problem is that um, only those are being there, right? So we do not recognize properly what female, what diverse uh, uh, um, uh, contributors to science are doing, right? Or we are not giving them opportunity to become scientists as well. So the idea is not that it's a problem to be male or, or white. The problem is that many times that space is being not allowed diversity to be occupied. And that's what we need to change because you know, talent is everywhere, right? So we need talent to be in that space. So when we do, we close the club. So for a few or so old, or those that just look like us is problematic. We have to be open, let them all come, you know, and whoever has talent stay, contribute. And that's the idea. And, and that's where we have to understand that um, diversity is for that. It's to allow talent to come. Let's fight, let's the best win, but everybody who wants to be an opportunity to become a great scientist and to contribute um, their best. Good answer, Wagner, good answer. All right, we have another question here. Is it really the fall of US dominance in science or is it just that access to the internet and more open source information has promoted science activities in other countries? More level international playing field in science? That's Absolutely. I, I, I love that thinking, right? Um, what we see though, is that um, um, the US used to invest a lot in science, right? And that investment was important. And that's why the US was the one going to the moon, right? Uh, developing the internet, developing uh, computers, uh, um, uh, making it available for everybody, then developing the internet, right? So this is the type of thing that we see happen and actually put the US central, in central st stage in, in which we, uh, we are here today, right? So part of our development. Um, um, and uh, what we see is that this is actually going down. So for me, the access of other countries to technology and to science making is fantastic. And let it be, the problem is our funding is going down. And that's where I think that the, the dominance in the area is coming from is just because it's had, it has been quite tough to get funding for do our science in, a, in, in the lab. And every time less and less, more competition and less money. And uh, if we could actually increase that, we can actually keep uh, the US in, the, in prominence, maybe not dominance, but prominence in the world instead of cutting funding and seeing other countries and their priorities uh, um, advance in science. Good answer. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, I see one. Okay, do other countries have equivalent federal funding agencies to NIH and NSF modeled on those of the US? Well, um, um, Europe has very good funding, um, less and less as well, but has good funding as well. Um, they actually have this European Union collaborative funding that allocate large sums of money to uh, international or within European communities there. Um, and um, I'll tell you that the Chinese government invests a lot in um, um, the, the Chinese uh, uh, National Academies of Science um, is unbelievably uh, large. Um, scientists there have a, a, a reputation among, amongst the population. If you say that you're a scientist with the Chinese Academy of, of Sciences, you are, you, you go to a, a bar and they, you know, you, they, you don't even have to pay. I have, I have seen that because I've been there. So uh, it's, it is an amazing thing. And yeah, they do have, and China is investing. Nowadays, for example, it's much cheaper for me to send my, my DNA to China to be sequenced and get the data than send to California, for example. So yes, they are, advancing. they are advancing a lot. They are investing a lot 
and while the United States is uh, allocating less and less funding because they do allocate that for military operations, right? So, and that's like um, the, 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 the counter um, balance that they do. Um, um, with, with a problem to, to science funding. Uh, there's another one here. Do you think the pandemic helped or hurt the plight of science in the US? Michelle, fantastic questions. I think we could actually talk for, for hours, right? Um, I love it. So um, the, um, I think that there are two ways, right? So I think that the public was uh, better educated in science, right? What a, what's a peer review? Uh, what is the, the trials to develop a vaccine? mRNA, right? Uh, became household uh, uh, word. Um, so in this was, and people could see how um, the uh, science could contribute to, to uh, humanity. On the other hand, we also saw these anti-science movements. Um, but I think that this is actually not because of the pandemic. It is, it came and also it became very big uh, uh, during the pandemic and on pandemic uh, issues. But I will tell you that um, uh, this is everywhere, right? So we are finding now this divide, science anti science, a po political divide, and this goes on gun violence, goes in so many other areas. So I don't think that the pandemic itself, but rather it, it for sure exacerbates and uh, uh, it, it polarizes as well. But I think overall, um, I think it was an opportunity for society to understand how science works. Okay, good. Got another question here. Is there an anti-science movement in the USA? Michael, thank you for coming. Yeah, well, um, I would say that there are many movements and each one, right, is different from each other, separate, but there are, you know, we have Earth, uh, Flat Earth, for example, you have uh, anti-vaccination uh, movements, right? That are very big in the United States and especially in certain communities. So yeah, I would say that there are, and I think that book that I, I mentioned um, could, uh, could be an interesting one for um, uh, uh, an ex um, excellent reading to understand better the phenomenon. All right, the next one here, this is an interesting one. Do companies like SpaceX that overtake the government in certain areas of scientific advancement represent healthy competition for the US or a concerning lack of federal funding? Yeah, Nathaniel, interesting question. And you know, I have no problem with, you know, um, bringing private money to, uh, to science and helping us. Google, right? Fantastic. Uh, uh, Amazon, right? Bringing some, you know, some uh, computational power, um, uh, SpaceX. So what happens is that these private companies, they are injecting funding and it's fantastic. I, I love it. But at the same time, they have their bottom line, right? So we also need public funding so that we also have priorities that are not with somebody's pockets, but with the good of society in general, right? So what are the priorities that will not bring money, but are important for society to move on, right? So maybe the, uh, um, the study of rare diseases, right? That we do not have uh, 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 it's not very interesting for for uh, um, companies to develop uh, to develop uh, uh, medication because so few people would would uh, uh, buy, but rather right. So the the, the um, certain vaccines, the mRNA vaccine for coronavirus was actually the basic science was invest public investment, starting from 1950s and on. So that when the pandemic hit, companies could get this information and, and develop products very quickly, amazingly quick with their, with their uh, uh, structure, but yet using public funding that came there, public uh, uh, knowledge that was, that was with, uh, made with public funding, because at that moment, 
it was not interesting for, for companies to uh, invest that type of capital in, in science that perhaps could not give the result that they want. So it's very important that we have this uh, uh, private com company investment in science, but very important, essential to have government invest in science that might not bring immediate uh, capital to, to people, but advanced knowledge as a whole that can be used for in, in future. Good, good questions. You got a couple more here. Um, thanks so much for the excellent talk. So much to think about. Is systematic reviews which started in clinical world slash medicine being used in plant sciences? Um, Janet, yes, absolutely. You know, um, the, the, the methods of systematic reviews, right, are very useful in any, sci in any, any, any area of science. And uh, you, you as a, a um, um, nutritional scientist understand how it, a, you can do this in a, in a systematic way, reviewing uh, literature in humans. But yeah, we can absolutely do that. And we do. I have a paper that I published uh, in 2018 it was a systematic review on how anthocyanins, antioxidants in plants um, were, were synthesized, stored, and how we can actually make purple vegetables full of anthocyanins. And uh, um, that was a systematic review. And, um, and with that, we, we also proposed hypotheses that can be tested, but uh, and has, has been quite cited. Um, in the field more than 100 times. So this is a type of, of um, uh, uh, thing that we can do absolutely. Systematic reviews are uh, essential for bringing the knowledge together and amassing all this dispersed information each, from each scientist published all together. Very useful for whoever is uh, starting and also who uh, um, um, understands but have a, a sparse understanding of the, of the system. Thank you for your yeah. question. Appreciate it. There's another, there's another one for you. Do you think the trend of the anti-vaccine movement will continue or start to slow slash decrease? Hayden, I um, that's a puzzle, right? I mm -hmm. expect people to have common sense, um, and um, and with the pandemic, right, be convinced to. Um, uh, uh, that vaccines can be good and, um, and and give up on their belief, but because beliefs are beliefs are very uh, powerful, right? Um, and also because you know many times scientists and science in general can be uh, can be insensitive in understanding other people's perspective, right? So the, the the way that sometimes we come to society, we have also to look critical thinking, right? Come look uh, um, uh, uh, inside and say, how am I approach the scientific method or how can I, am I approach the scientific truth with society, right? And this, this happened with the transgenic movements, right? So companies were eager to put transgenic foods in the eighties in the market. And they were just like, you have to go down the throat of, uh, throat of the consumer. Well, what happened is that there was a, a backlash. So with the same thing with the, with the anti um, um, or vaccination hesitancy, hesitancy, right? So what happens is that we have to, we have to take an educational approach and also um, trying to understand where they are coming from and trying to tackle that. But I, I don't know, it's very difficult with this polarization of understanding and, and opinions in society. Beliefs are very, uh, very uh, strong to, to come um, forward. So I think that um, it, it's a next chapter. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, some really, really, really good questions here. So let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, we appreciated the opportunity to visit with you this evening. If you have any additional questions about the course, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Benedito. Dr. Benedito's email address is, let me put it in the chat here, copy. 
It is in the chat. So there's his email address. An archive version of this webinar will be available later on the Honors College website. Thank you for spending time with us. Please continue to stay safe and be well. Good night, everyone. Um, Wagner, that is about, that is it right there. So thank you so very much for your time. Thank you for the excellent presentation. And there were some excellent questions as well. So everyone, have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.